uh, welcome back to Open Relationships Transforming Together. I'm your host, Andrea Miller, joined by my co-host, Joanna Schroeder, and producer, Brian Atkins. We have a really fun, really different show for you today. And, and forget fun and forget different. Why is this important? Because it is all about bad boss stories, toxic work relationships, and we bring the goods when it comes to how to deal with these things effectively. So with no further ado, um, Brian, are you going to kick us off? Yeah. So we at the team grab some uh, grab some fun questions and, and weird stories that people wanted to share. Um, and this first one, uh, just uh, we're just going to start off. Um, am I the a-hole for ignoring my boss and blocking his number while I went on vacation? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it says, my boyfriend and I are currently long distance. We take turns visiting each other. I have requested five days off, which was approved from my job. It was after my shift. I was heading out quickly. I had to pick up my boyfriend from the airport. I clocked out. And while I was saying bye to everyone, my new boss of two weeks stopped me and asked if I could cover a shift since one of my coworkers called in, st in sick. We're short staffed and he needs me to stay for a couple hours more. I had a 10 hour shift and I was exhausted. I responded no. I'm unable to do that, and I can't stay late. I have covered shifts before in the past. I don't mind, but I had somewhere to be, obviously. I mentioned I was picking someone up at the airport. He told me they could take an Uber. So her boyfriend wouldn't be happy if they did that, and also he doesn't have a key, so he can't get in anyway. Um, he called me a lousy coworker and that I'm not a quote-unquote team player. Uh, while driving to the airport, I kept getting calls and texts from him, and it got so bad I had to pull over and turn off my phone. My boss was calling me to come back to work. I got over 15 texts, so I finally blocked his number. When I went back to work, my boss called me into his office. He blew up, but he blew up at me for being unprofessional, and he's still new to this job. I should have helped out or at least replied to the emails. I responded other people could have helped him. It's not my responsibility when I'm literally on vacation, and so I got my first write-up ever. Is, something, is there something I'm missing? Did I do something wrong here? I'm actually considering reporting him. Again, he's still new to this job, but am I the a-hole? No, no. I feel like she was totally in the right. And when I think about in this situation, the fact that they're they're short staffed is not on her, right? And so, I mean, we've been in that, you know, I'm I'm a CEO and founder and and run a business and you know, putting myself in her boss's shoes. First of all, what's going on with him? Why didn't he jump in, right? That, I'm going to ask that question. And then the second one is when i putting myself back in those shoes, when we've been short-staffed and stuff has gone sideways, as much as it is tempting, and I do think it is um, instinctive as a human being to want to blame other people, I will say to myself, why don't we have redundancy in my business, in our business, right? And so to the extent this sounds like somebody who has been um, conscientious and a team player in other situations, but she had she had a boundary in her work life. And I think she she was in the right to exercise that boundary. And I'm going to I'm going to call out the the new boss who didn't understand that he stepped into a role that um, that was uh, that the company was um, not prepared and that he didn't say either let me find somebody else or honestly that he didn't say you know have a great vacation I, listen he's not wrong to ask and then when she says no then the right answer is have a great vacation um and then he needs to either say what can i do or do we close early or do i get somebody else from my team but that's your i mean that's the boss's job Honestly, yeah, so that's, I'm going to say that she's not job. the a-hole that he he handled it badly. This is a funny one because like just based on the headline, I was sure that she was going to be in the wrong, right? It just seemed so much like, okay, you can't block your boss. It seemed like so dramatic. And then of course, <laughs> throughout I'm like, oh no, she <laughs> she was in the right, I think. Yeah, I mean, and listen, if she could have done it, and maybe if the circumstances were different, if she'd asked for that vacation, but she was like 
okay, I'm starting my vacation. I'm going to go home and pack. I'm going to take a nap. I'm going to relax. You know, and then if she really could have, then it would have been amazing for her to do it. And again, as a, as a CEO, I'm so grateful to work with a team of people that will step in when needed. But if somebody's catching a flight or picking up a boyfriend, it's like, you know what? You've got a life to live. And that, you know, it just, it stinks. But I do hope the boss takes away that they are understaffed and that's yeah. on him to fix. Yep. yep. And think. hopefully, you know, you really don't want to be putting your psychological default on someone else. Like, and that's what I think happens a lot of times with bosses where you get a problem where it's like, if it, the boss has a problem that was their making and they abuse that power by making you feel like you did something wrong. She didn't do anything wrong and she got written up. That's the part that makes me so mad. It wasn't just that he was being pissy. He wrote her up. So yeah, that's no, going to be in her file. Yeah, it's an abdication of responsibility. But let me say this. This isn't just in, in a boss um, uh, subordinate relationship. This is in a lot of sibling relationships and, and spousal relationships and parenting relationships. Blame is toxic and and insidious and pervasive and it's so easy to say no 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 it's the other person but if you're really if you really really want to make change in your life i say look at the discomfort that you're in and say what did i do to contribute to it how do i solve the problem and let me quit pointing the finger because pointing the finger almost never helps and i can't think of a time when it does but i never want to say never <laughs> Well, and when you when you're the boss, also there's a lot of responsibility to do your work because you have power over people, right? So it's like even more than the other people of the company, you have power. I think you do that really well at work here, Andrea. <laughs> All right, and this one is from askamanager.org. Can you force an employee to meet with a quote unquote spiritual leader? Wait, so what? <laughs> This I mean, person the answer says is no, but now it's like, yeah. tell me more. <laughs> so it says, um, this person says, I work at a small nonprofit, and recently the employee with the longest institutional knowledge just left her position because of the years of abuse, micromanagement, and overwork that she endured. Now, the executive director is trying to set up an all-staff meeting with a spiritualist so she can figure out why there has been so much negative energy in the building. I feel deeply offended that I'm being required to attend a consultation and a subsequent quote unquote cleansing. Uh, I don't have I don't have a connection with this sort of spiritual practice, and it feels unethical to require staff's attendance. What do you think? Oh, I, I God, this is a tough one. When I think about back to abdication of responsibility, if the person that had been in the role has left uh, after uh, un under what seemed like um, dubious circumstances, I, I, did you use the word abuse? I, I feel like yeah, it, they they said abuse. Yeah, that's what I thought I heard. Um, so again, it sounds like maybe a a very big blind spot, um, or or maybe it's it's a willful like willful not willing to accept, willfully not willing to accept responsibility for the departure. Of this person and having this um, toxic work environment now to the credit of the boss to the extent that it's like hey we've got problems and we're bringing somebody in under the auspices of making positive change i mean let's face it i, I mean we even did this a long time ago at your tango again and you know kind of in the in the spirit of keeping it real we had a consultant you know we were in a just a challenging time we hired a consultant that was trying to help us figure out where where were their disconnects, right? And I I was on board and it was like, okay, where am I seeing blind, or where, where do I have blind spots? Where are things disconnected? Now, let me just also say, it ended up being an utter waste of time. We worked through, <laughs> we worked through with the issues and, you know, I mean, just like any, uh, you know, any organization that some relation, you know, some companies will go through these periods of stress in hardship and the best companies I think learn from it. And I think the best um, leaders will be open and go, okay, where am I contributing to the heartache and to the toxicity or the, you know, the, the challenges? I don't, I, it feels like, so if you were to, if you were to substitute 
consultant with spiritual advisor, right? Then you would say, well, yeah, like the boss is saying, where are my, where is it a disconnect? Here's what I would say to that person. I would have a, by the way, um, most employees have more power. Most of you employees have more power than you realize. I'm going to say it again. Most of you employees have more power than you realize. Tell us and, more about that. Yeah, no, it's, <laughs> it's using your voice. It's asking great questions, but it is 1,000% incumbent upon you to not come across as, I mean, this is my advice, um, defensive, accusatory. Like, if you're going to if you're going to try to uh, leverage power against somebody that is superior to you um, and do it in a way that is going to um, put them on the defensive, you, you've probably already lost. Right. So if you're in, but if your true intention is, I want to succeed in my career, I want my boss to succeed, I want us as a company to succeed, I really care. And I'm, I'm, I'm willing to ask questions that might be a little uncomfortable, but I'm willing to do it in a way that leads to a better outcome. That's power. And I, I feel like a lot of people are just, they, they don't, they don't get it or they feel uncomfortable. So I say all this because when I think of that, person who you can tell she's uh she is um just doesn't have a, probably a lot of respect for the boss um isn't very open to probably how he or she I, I think it was a man wants to make change in the organization so what i would say to her rather than just saying yes or no i would say listen if you really care about the organization you care about your success there then then sit down with the boss and say here are my concerns and I really want this to lead to a better outcome, but I want to establish uh, ground rules. And let's say the boss's name is Frank. So Frank, what what I, you know, I'm willing to do it, but I feel like we need to establish um, the, you know, the circumstances. So whatever insights the spiritual advisor slash consultant is willing to show to us where where you might have challenges, where others in the organization might have challenges. And let's be really clear. What questions are they going to ask? What is their role going to be? Right? Because if there is a wise, impartial third party, which is basically what a therapist does, right? And they're able to shine a light where maybe it's a little uncomfortable for that light to be shown and ask good questions. Well, that, that could very well be be a way for the organization to heal and for the the boss frank or whatever his name is to benefit from it so i i just feel like it it is an opportunity for the organization to grow and heal but when i think about this young woman or this person who is um putting up these objections i want to say all right you have more power than you realize and exercise it wisely if you want a better outcome be part of the solution it reminds me a little bit of like toxic positivity, but in this case, I'll say toxic spirituality where you have somebody who is using all these kind of gimmicks, like they, these, 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 a cleansing or whatever, these things might work in certain circumstances for certain people. But if you're doing this more spiritual based thing instead of doing the work, that is when you're misusing it feels toxic, you know, it, it sounds like this boss is the one that has to take responsibility. And when you are the boss, that is a huge responsibility to make sure that you don't have a toxic, abusive, exhaustive, exploitive workplace. And, you know, maybe, like you said, maybe this spiritual advisor will say, hey, Frank, <laughs> you've created this. These bad vibes are something you're bringing in. Or maybe that person will just come in and burn some sage and nothing will be fixed at all. So, I mean, I, I hope that the outcome works out, but it's it certainly, you know, just legally, it doesn't seem like they could force this person to participate. I don't know. I wonder well, if there's I mean, a I think, legality listen, I think, to it. Yeah, I don't know if I, that's a good question. I guess that's for uh, in, an HR expert. But when I think about as a matter of, hey, we're, you know, we're paying, you know, this person is here from 12 or three to four o'clock and you're you're on the clock from you know that time just like if you're required to meet your boss or you're required to meet somebody the idea of saying hey legally you can't be forced into meeting or you know being part of a group um 
presentation, I don't know. I mean, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not an HR expert, so I, I don't look at it uh, as on legal grounds. It's that religious aspect, I think, that's where you get dicey, you know? It could, be, Yeah, it could be. And to the extent that, I mean, just people are forced to do things or not allowed to do things uh, on legal grounds, it does, that does, that's not what it sounds like. It sounds like this is somebody who's saying, uh, you know, the boss is bad news and... Um, I, and I don't want to play ball. I mean, that's what it sounds like to me. All right. This next one is a short one. Um, am I the a-hole for calling my boss out in a meeting? Um, my boss tends to infuriate me because he always answers a question with another question, even if it's something simple. I've long suspected he does this to avoid saying, I don't know. And I've talked to him multiple times privately about how this frustrates me. In a meeting today... He had done this about four times in the span of 20 minutes, and I called him out in front of everyone. I said, quote, you know, it's really frustrating when you won't give an answer to a simple question. If you gave us answers and then asked questions, that would be fine. But you always just ask questions instead of actually helping us. And that is your job. He then got visibly upset, threw his binder down on the table and left the building. He hasn't come back. And this was nearly three hours ago. Am I the a-hole for saying something? My coworkers have shown me support after the fact, but I'm still a tad worried about my job at this point. Boy, is this an episode from The Office? I'm just wondering if that's Michael, like uh, getting in his his Toyota Prius. It's very uh, Michael Scott. <laughs> Dwight, yeah, just uh, you know, did went round and round with him. I I, I think listen, I think it's it, this is tough, but but they always say it's like um, praise in public, criticize in private. And to call somebody out is almost never effective. It's like, it just, it feels like it was um, a misguided way to to try to get the good outcome. Now, let's face it, the guy might come, ho hopefully comes back, come back, boss. Um, and we'll say, okay, you know, I didn't like this. But I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, it's like you, ha the employee had to go that far to get the attention because it sounds like they'd already addressed it. Um, but I just, I feel like calling people out publicly is really a bad idea. I also feel like there is, I mean, let's face it, there's almost always um, another side of the coin. And to the extent that the, the boss is using the Socratic method and trying to get the, the team to think more deeply and to problem solve. I mean, I could as a as a parent, and you know, sometimes as a as a leader, it's like somebody asks a question, and it's like like you're trying to ask questions to help them come up with answers, right? So I do feel like this, you know, maybe the employee was a little immature and saying, "Well, it's your it's your you know it's your job to give us the answers." It feels like there is a middle ground to. Um, you know, it's like if you keep going round and round and asking questions and never get to an answer, that ends up being a problem. But I also feel like if the if the if it wasn't malintent on the behalf of the boss and he was answering a question with a question to sincerely try to guide the person to get to the answer themselves. That's a it, big a, if, though. It is a big yeah, if. It is. It is a big yeah. if. But then if the but I again, I feel like the coworker or the the employee could take power into his or her own hands and say, all right, if I'm going to, if I'm asking you a question, you ask me a question back, whatever answer I give you, then that's what we're going with. You see what I'm saying? Like you could, this say, is one I of actually, those, like, yeah, go Brian. I, I, I might actually side with the employee on this one because I've, I've been in this exact situation and there are some types of dude bosses, a dude bosses, especially that like, they can never admit to not knowing something or like being wrong about something. And they do this crap where like you try to get a straight answer from them or whatever, and they never give it to you because they don't know what they're doing and they don't want to admit that they don't know. And like, it's like, well, you hired me for my expertise. Like, let me give it then. Um, but it's like a there's... good idea executed poorly. It's a good well, idea to go the to the boss. But yeah. But I have done this before, too, though. It was one of my first jobs, uh, my first like in the industry jobs. And the boss, like, like I would go to them privately every single time and they would never fix the problem. And then I had to like in a meeting be like, so what about that thing that I keep coming to you about? 
you know, or whatever. And like, you have to then bring it up in front of everybody. They get the wash and get embarrassed. And then they like get mad at you. But it's like, then things changed. They didn't change until you got embarrassed. Want... Like, so yeah. sometimes yeah. you kind of have to, push you do a have bit. to put the power into your own, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. And it, but it also reinforces what we always say in relationships was, which is when you start to feel your blood pressure rise and your heart rate rise, that's usually not the best time to speak. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, and it's also the hardest time to keep yourself from speaking too. You're like, oh, but anyway, lots to learn from that one. By the way, let me just add one other quick thing. Just, just, and now I totally get there are some people that aren't competent and they don't get the cues and so forth. So I'm, I'm trying to be generous in assuming the best for the employee and the boss, but the employee, and just, just to drive the point home a little bit more. Ooh, that's why I always say we should over communicate here at your tango. I am guilty at times of just assuming what I've I've said or asked for is really clear. And as much as the employee is insisting on his or her version of the story, it is conceivable that there is that there is that disconnect, right? And so when I think um, not assuming, like, uh, uh, how do we say uh, assuming good intentions of other people to me? Yeah, yeah. Is Give really, the benefit really, of the doubt. Yeah, giving the benefit of the doubt. And if it means, let's face it, sometimes you have to go round and round two or three times and you think, well, they're an idiot. Like, why should I? It's not my job. Why should I have to explain? I mean, at times it's like, well, it's not your job, but it's in your it's to your benefit of um, assuming um, good intent and being willing to have a conversation an extra time or two where you feel like you shouldn't have to. I mean, there are no shoulds. It's like, listen, if you're if you are in a role and you want to be successful in that role, work with your coworkers and boss and subordinates to succeed. Right. Like there should be no should. Yeah. And assuming mm -hmm. that everyone's doing the best they can in that moment. And sometimes I do that too much where I'll be like, well, I'm sure that something was this and that. And then and people will be like, you can assume the worst for one time. Like you, you don't, you know, you. But when you are in that kind of situation, it does feel most productive to just be like, I assume Brian is doing the very best he can right now. He's not trying to hurt us. <laughs> Sometimes we have to tell ourselves that. Yeah, yeah. Not no, that Brian's that, ever that, hurt that, us, of that course. Is being, that's being a grown up. That's being mature. And that's, I mean, and it is empowering versus giving your power away. If it's like, oh, that person's just an idiot or an a-hole. Well, if you say so, right? Anyway, okay, we got one time for one more. Let's let it rip, Brian. Make it a good one. All right, this one's going to be a quick one, but am I the a-hole for not giving my boss my first class seat? Uh, um, so it says, yesterday my boss and I were flying home from a conference. We were on the same flight, but our original seats were not next to each other. I'm a frequent traveler on this airline and use their credit card, so I often get free upgrades to first class. I ended up getting upgraded on this flight, and obviously my boss did not. After the flight, when we were collecting our bags, she said she wanted to talk to me about my, quote, lack of respect for protocol. She thinks that because the company paid for my original ticket and she is more senior than me, I should have given her the first class seat. I think this is absolutely insane. And while the company did pay for my original seat, it's my own personal credit card and spending and the frequent travel that is what earned me the upgraded seat. Is this some kind of corporate standard I'm not aware of? Am I no, able? no. Oh my God. This is, this is a, and unfortunately I'm going to have to call out the bo bad boss for just being immature and petty. And the employee is absolutely in the right to have, they got the upgrade and they took it. Right. And that's it. Like there's, to me, there's no more to this story than that. Some people can't be happy for other people. It's like, they're so insecure, like, I'm the boss, I deserve this. It's like, be happy. Be happy for this person that they got to sit in yeah, first Yeah, it's class. Like, like, rather than, exactly, it's like, rather than it, it uh, it's an affront and something was taken away from you, it, totally. So, okay, okay, that was fast. Brian, can we do, can we sneak <laughs> one more under the wire? I have one more that's a long one. And, well, actually, hold on, wait, no, here's a short one. Um, okay. I'll, go, I'll run through it quick, but this is uh, just for context. This is at a small machine shop, um, so lots of machinery type thing. Okay. Uh, it says, the previous, uh, my boss enforced a no tattoos policy. 
The previous owners retired and sold their stake in the business. And now the new owner is knowledgeable at the industry and actually seems like a decent manager, but he's, he's open to converting the shop to union um, and is generous. And I actually really like this guy. However, his one problem is tattoos. Employees may not have tattoos for any reason at all. The only exception is uh, for medical and like radiation alignment markers. Uh, I didn't even know those existed until it was brought up at an all hands meeting. Otherwise, he seems to think it's an anti gang thing. Um, last October, we passed over a new operator because the guy had sleeves on both arms. Our loss, right? This weekend, however, we lost our foreman, a man with more than 40 years experience as a machinist because he had a tattoo on his arm that he had never disclosed and he had never mentioned it. I didn't even know he had it. Our new owner called it a Nazi tattoo because he thought it was identical to the tattoos German regime used in the Second World War. The tattoo? His grandmother's numbers. The ones she had forcibly put on her body when she was a child in the German concentration camps. He wore the numbers to honor his late grandmother and the horror she survived before coming to the U.S. I am beyond livid at this, not only for losing our best man, but for such an idiotic reason. Um, I'm not necessarily looking for answers. It's not my problem or issue. And our foreman says he's looking to forward to some free time now. He's kind of joking and claiming he's happy to not be working. But I am so beyond mad because it seems like nobody else seems to care. Oof. Yeah. That's... Yeah. I mean, I feel like that's really obvious. I just think that is um, I mean, I think it's obvious to to almost anybody how how ridiculous and narrow minded that person is and and really like a like a serious blind spot. So I, I would say um, I mean, this person's not asking if they should leave the company or, or anything like that. I think the only thing that I I guess I would say maybe if he and some of his colleagues wanted to band together and very with heartfelt intentions to talk to the new owner and say, we love this company. Um, you know, we, we care about our success together and, and we really like to have an open discussion about what happened to the foreman and what it means, you know, what tattoos mean to, to us and most people and, and really ask him to revisit this policy. But yeah, it feels like it's going to be a very toxic work environment and they're going to lose more people or, and have a tough time replacing yeah. the people that they lose. So I, I mean, it, in the spirit of empowerment to say, hey, I'm, I'm willing you know, to lead a, a sincere conversation with the intention for this person to, to understand where we're coming from. You know, my hope is that they, they can be a change of heart, but, but that's, that's tough sledding. Agree, especially since you don't know why anyone has a tattoo. I have a tattoo here and it, it just looks pretty, but it's actually like dedicated to my friend who passed away two years ago. And so it's like someone can look at that and be like, oh, she needs to get attention or whatever. And the reality is it's very meaningful to me. So it's a silly thing to just judge all tattoos the same. But to get fired after 40 years of experience and service, like just because you had this tattoo, all, and then the one that's already there, it's not like you got a new one either. Like, but then yeah, right and then across to, his face. Yeah. <laughs> yeah like, <laughs> to, the, to the new boss. Yeah. Now that I feel like that's just really, it's just, it feels very narrow minded and, and more even like I narrow minded sounds um, judgy. I think ignorant. And when I think and of controlling controlling but but yeah like when i think ignorance there's ignorance often comes from a place of just just not knowing right and having a judgment that was handed down from somebody else um and the, and leading to you know unfortunate um decisions anyway okay we're gonna wrap up uh this was yet another great episode of open relationships transforming together i hope you got some great insights on uh, toxic work situations uh, follow us uh, fan us all those things um, subscribe we are so grateful to be able to bring this show to you uh, thank you very much <laughs>